Hello and welcome to today's lecture. Uh, it's called the Renaissance New Sciences and Religious Warfare. It's a day late because unfortunately uh, our campus was closed yesterday because of a water main break. So uh, I apologize for that. Uh, it's about 10 or so slides. And the first thing I want to talk about is the Renaissance. And if the Renaissance is something that you've had from World History 1, uh, it's just more of the same. Um, the Renaissance, it's a period of time that goes from about 1300 to 1600. It's not an overnight phenomenon. It actually takes quite a bit of time to develop. And there are really two key hallmarks of the Renaissance. One is this extreme hostility to the culture of the Middle Ages. And another thing is this fascination with the ancient world. Uh, people living through and experiencing the Renaissance, they don't really like what happened in the Middle Ages. They want to go back to ancient Roman times, and they want to go back to ancient Greek times. In fact, the people of the Renaissance are the first ones to come up with the term Dark Ages, which is what we think of the Middle Ages as now because of it. Uh, this love affair with the ancients leads to an increasing literacy in the Latin language and the Greek language. And this term Renaissance, uh, it's this rebirth of the classic Greek and Roman ways. And the main emphasis of the Renaissance is centered around the individual and human nature. Humanism is probably the biggest lasting effect of the Middle Age or not the Middle Age, but the Renaissance outside of its art. Uh, the Renaissance ideas all come together underneath this new philosophy known as humanism. Uh, this involved the study of all the classic Greek and Roman literature to create a new definition of what it meant to be human. Uh, very famously, Erasmus, who's one of these Renaissance thinkers, he says, men are made, not born. And this is a far cry from the medieval assumption that man was born with a soul and that's what distinguished him from animals. The humanists say to be truly human, you have to have a soul and you have to be educated. Uh, humanists, they differed from those who had studied the ancient works before. They did not feel inferior to the ancients. They saw themselves as equal to the Romans and they saw themselves as equal to the Greeks. And humanists, they stressed the dignity of man. Uh, they believed that, the, that man was the best of God's creatures below the angels. And they did not interpret ancient texts for Christian meanings. Uh, they instead tried to see these as their own. For example, Aristotle, who was a Greek philosopher, um, he was not pre-Christian because he lived centuries before Christ. He was a Greek man who understood the world in terms of his own Greek culture. Uh, in the Middle Ages, a lot of times people and philosophers would try to fit Aristotle into a Christian mold and the humanists say that's not possible to do. Two big names, two big thinkers of the Renaissance are Erasmus and Niccolo Machiavelli. Uh, Erasmus was a thinker, and that's a picture of him right there, from Northern Europe. And he's the best example of <clears throat> a Northern Renaissance thinker that we have. Uh, he was a Christian humanist who did his best to blend the humanities with traditional Christian religion. So he tried to take the idea of patience, calmness, and being broad-minded, and he wanted to add Christian values like love, faith, and hope to it. Um, he ended up becoming a reformer of, of religion, and he urged others to be tolerant of men. Uh, he wanted to purify religion and he was very instrumental and believed very highly in the idea of education for everybody. And lastly, um, <clears throat> Erasmus, he was really impressed with the purity and simplicity of the early Christian church. 
and he wanted to go back to the way things were when Christianity was founded. Machiavelli, on the other hand, he is a thinker of Italy, and he's very famous for writing a book called The Prince. The Prince is a book, um, best way to describe it is it's a how-to manual for the Medici family on how to rule the city of Florence. The Medici family are very important. They're very rich. The Medici family are the personal bankers of the Pope. And through their involvement with money and through their involvement with the church, <clears throat> the Medici family became the rulers of Florence. So Machiavelli is going to write this how-to manual to the Medici family as they're ruling the city of Florence and he focuses really on the individual qualities needed to rule and the prince has a lot of harsh advice he talks about murder he talks about betrayal uh, basically do what you have to do to stay in power there's no idea of divine right there's no belief in your ruling because that's your god-given right Machiavelli says you have to earn the right to rule and you have to do that any way possible and a lot of people say that Machiavelli is the best representation of the ideas of Aristotle in the Renaissance and Machiavelli thought personally that he best represented Aristotle's idea of a perfect human Renaissance art is the most recognizable part of the Renaissance. The Ninja Turtles, for example. Michelangelo, Donatello, Raphael, Leonardo, they're not just turtles, they are the biggest Renaissance artists. And in the Renaissance, this idea of personal recognition became important. You wanted to be recognized for the work you did because that meant that other people would hire you as an artist or a sculptor and it would increase your earnings potential. <clears throat> this is very different from the Middle Ages where in the Middle Ages people often remained anonymous on their works. So a great example is Michelangelo and I have here on the right hand side a picture of the Pietà which is the Mother Mary holding a crucified Jesus. When the Pietà went on display, a lot of people thought that it was sculpted by Raphael. And Michelangelo, in the middle of the night, broke into the church where this was being displayed and carved his name into the Mother Mary's dress so everybody would know it was him. Uh, he later regretted doing this, but the reason he did it, he wanted recognition. He wanted the honors of being noticed. He hoped that the personal recognition, people seeing the work he could do, would lead to more work. Another significant change in Renaissance art is Renaissance art is not as influenced by the church as it would have been in the Middle Ages. Very often in the Middle Ages, uh, you would have somebody sitting in what was called prayer pose, which is when you, you put your arms together in prayer position and you look up at the sky like you're looking up at the heavens or the angels. And then <clears throat> there would often be angels painted behind you or something like that, or, or like a glowing sun behind you. And it was very churchy if you will and even if you're not religious you know what I mean here well when we get to Renaissance art because a lot of the art was driven by those who paid for it the people who paid for the art may or may not want that religious pose so people start being painted as they appear warts and all wrinkles and all people start being painted with everyday items and then just everyday items in general start to be painted as well. 
Now, with that being said, if you read through the book, you may see something about the Northern Renaissance versus the Southern Renaissance. The Southern Renaissance, almost completely devoid of church influence. The Northern Renaissance, there's a little bit more church influence, but there's still a lot of real world depiction. For example, in the Northern Renaissance, you may still be painted with your sports car, but you'll be driving the sports car while having your head up in prayer pose. There's also this copying of a lot of Greek and Roman work. And then a man named Albrecht Dürer, um, he was from Northern Germany and the Holland area. Albrecht Dürer comes up with the idea of perspective. He figures out that you can draw in 3D to make an image stand out or pop out. So if you've ever taken a high school or middle school drawing class or art class and they've tried to teach you 3D illusions, Albrecht Dürer is the one who starts that and he started it during the Renaissance art. Uh, music, because we don't talk about that very often unless you're taking music history or music appreciation, the music of the Renaissance is very often set to hymns, it's set to religious masses, and there are magicals which are these dance movements. And the main reason that they have to use these hymns, masses, and magicals for their musical entertainment, it's because very little, if any, Greek or Roman music survived. If Greek or Roman music had survived, it's very likely the musicians of the Renaissance would have used that. But instead, they did the best they could. Now the scientific revolution. Uh, the scientific revolution is happening towards the end of the Renaissance. So it, they are happening at almost the same time. Um, if you want to date it, the scientific revolution is said to be begun around 1543. That is when the scientist Copernicus is working. And then it's said to end around 1687. That is when Isaac Newton publishes the book Principia Mathematica. Now this was made possible by strong nation states with stability. The stability meant that they could spend money on science instead of wars. And monarchs, they want to increase their, their prestige and power through scientific achievement. Uh, merchants can participate because they have acquired independent wealth. And then there's this lack of the supernatural. The, the idea of the witch craze has died down. There's lots of people living in cities. There's not as much superstition. So research begins to switch to a math-based science. Yes, there was science and research before the scientific revolution, but it's going to become very math-based with algebra, trigonometry, and other subjects like that driving the research. So Nikolai Copernicus is the first big name of the scientific revolution, and he lives from 1473 to 1543. Uh, he's the one who, quote, discovered the sun is at the center of the solar system. And this was important because this discovery robbed mankind of its traditional view of being the center of the universe. Uh, he came up with a theory that the Earth had this elliptical orbit around the sun. Uh, this is a theory now known as the Copernican heliocentrism. And as a thank you for his work on putting the Earth in its rightful place, uh, he was condemned by the Inquisition, and he was put to death. He does publish a book. The book is called On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. I'm sure you have all read it. Another really important name of the scientific revela uh, revolution is a guy named Johann Kepler. I don't have Kepler on the slide, but I did want to at least mention him. Uh, he formulates the three laws of planetary motion. All planets move around the sun in elliptical orbits. All planets sweep out equal areas in equal lengths of time. And the square of the orbital period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. In other words, it has a, a constant speed of orbit around the sun. 
Galileo Galilei. Uh, people know of Galileo. Uh, he lived from 1564 to 1642. He created one of the earliest telescopes. He, he didn't invent the telescope. That's actually a, a myth, but he creates one of the earliest refractive telescopes that's used, and he's able to observe the stars and the motion of the planets using his refractive telescope. Galileo is the one who publishes the proof of Copernicus's theory. He formally states the Earth rotates around the Sun, and he's forced to recant by the church. He's placed under house arrest for saying officially the Sun was the center of the solar system, and he has to live under house arrest for the rest of his life. And once Galileo is forced to recant his life's work, he is forced to give up all of his scientific work under penalty of death. Isaac Newton, he lives from 1642 to 1727. He is one of the developers of what is today calculus. So if you have taken a calculus class and you dislike calculus as much as I do, uh, thanks Isaac Newton. But calculus, its purpose originally was to put math into motion. So Isaac Newton and Leibniz are going to come up with formula and ways to mathematically model planetary motion. Once that's done, Isaac Newton is able to develop the idea of the principle of gravity. He's able to come up with Newtonian physics, which is what's going to put physics and astronomy together into a brand new scientific field. And then he writes probably the most important book of all time, at least scientifically. It's called the, the Philosophy Naturalis Mathematica Principia, or the Principles of Mathematics. Another really important thing about the scientific revolution, there are a lot of new inventions. Uh, the purity of glass that's developed during the scientific revolution leads to better telescopes, better microscopes, uh, new mathematical developments like the decimal and logarithms means calculations can be done faster. Calculus is used to describe algebra in motion. Uh, you can tell the weather using barometers and thermometers. Uh, there are new royal societies set up to support scientific discoveries. England has the Royal Society of London. France has the Paris Academy of Sciences. And believe it or not, coffee shops become very important to the scientific revolution, especially in England. People like Kepler, Copernicus, Isaac Newton definitely did a lot of their work in coffee shops. And coffee shops were more than a Starbucks. They were places where, where lectures were given. They were places where ideas were bounced off of each other. And coffee shops were more like, I guess, libraries today, if you will. One last thing about the scientific revolution is the idea of the philosophs. The philosophs are an informal group of writers, political reformers, and religious skeptics. And they can be also put in with the Renaissance, or not the Renaissance, but the, the Enlightenment. So I don't want to go too far into talking about the philosophs. But one of the philosophs, René Descartes, he's also very important in the mathematical world. He's the one who separated the ideas of intangible thought from that of observable reality. So he said there's a difference between thinking and being able to produce results. And his very famous quote is, I think, therefore I am. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the second part of this lecture has to do with the idea of the Reformation. Uh, the Reformation is a religious movement that happens in the early 1500s to the middle of the 1500s 
And the best known name of the Renas or the Reformation is Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther is not the first to try and reform Christianity. He's not the last, but he is the biggest name of the 1500s. Now, in the early 1500s, late 1400s, there's a lot of things happening in Christianity that were being called into question. One was clerical ignorance. Um, to make this easy to understand, after the Black Death of the 1300s and the 1400s, the Black Plague, if you will, so many Catholic priests have died or left the service of the church that they basically just hired anybody they could. So some estimates are as few as 2 to 5% of the people working for the Catholic Church actually knew what was going on. The rest of them were faking it. They were ignorant of the liturgy, if you will. Another big thing that was happening, these same Catholic priests were openly living with women, in some cases getting married, and in some cases having children. All of those things are against the, the rules, if you will. And instead of making the priests stop, the Catholic Church was just asking for money to be paid and then they were sweeping it all underneath the rug. And along with this infidelity comes uh, gambling and drinking and other stuff that the priests should not have been doing. So Martin Luther, who was a Catholic monk, he lived in monasteries from a fairly young age. Um, when he was in his teens, he wanted to be a lawyer. He was studying to be a lawyer. A storm comes along and he pledges his life to the church if, if he survives. And he survived the storm. He entered the service of the church. And he does everything a good Catholic priest should do. He says his prayers. He goes to mass. He does his penances. He does his um, confessions. But no matter what happens, he, d he feels like his sin, his, his um, evilness is not forgiven. So he starts to reflect on this. And on October 31st, 1517, as you've already read, he posts the 95 Theses on the church door in at Wittenberg Castle. And this is going to be a list of 95 things that he has a problem with that he wants the Catholic Church and specifically the Pope to fix. He argued against the idea that the Pope was infallible. In the Catholic Church at the time, it was believed that only the Pope could interpret Scripture and the Pope was always right. And Martin Luther said, we are all men, we are all equal, none of us are perfect, therefore the Pope cannot be perfect. He also argued against this idea of indulgences. And when I teach indulgences, I basically tell people they're like, get out of hell free cards. You could buy an indulgence instead of asking for forgiveness. You could buy an indulgence for something you have not done yet. So maybe you're going to rob a bank tomorrow, you could ask for forgiveness a day early. Or you could even buy forgiveness for somebody who has passed already. So your dear Aunt Sally could have ran over a cat 20 years ago and you could buy her forgiveness. Another thing that Martin Luther does is he develops this idea that salvation was based on faith alone. Um, salvation is a gift from God and all you have to do is accept it. Where in the Catholic Church there are certain rules and certain regulations you had to follow and certain hoops and steps you had to go through, Martin Luther is going to say, no, all you have to do is have an idea of justification by faith alone. And this idea of justification by faith alone is the basis of the Lutheran church today. In response to this, Catholics are going to have what's called the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent, it's about a 30-year meeting that happens off and on. They're going to look at everything that's going on with Martin Luther's beliefs, the ideas of John Calvin, and some others who came before those two. 
and they're going to say um, everybody else is wrong, we're right. Um, they reaffirm pretty much everything that they had already believed. For example, they say the Pope is infallible, the Pope is the only one who can interpret scripture, salvation is based on the idea of faith and good works, but they do a couple of things. They, they create two new orders of nuns. One group of nuns is supposed to go and work with poor and lower class people. Another group of nuns is supposed to work with women and help raise small children to be good Catholics. They also come up with this idea known as the Society of Jesus or Jesuits. And when I teach the Society of Jesus, I like to refer to them as stormtroopers. They're basically the Pope's stormtroopers. If the Pope needs anything done, he sends the Jesuits. Or if the Pope needs anybody to be converted to Christianity, whether it's forcible or voluntary, he sends the Society of Jesus. So whenever Europeans go to Asia, Jesuits go with and start converting people in China and Japan and Vietnam. When Europeans go to Africa to get involved with the slave trade, Jesuits go with there. And then when Europeans go to North and South America for colonization, you guessed it, Jesuits go there as well and they convert people to Christianity. With the Reformation comes some wars of religion. There are many different pieces of uh, religious wars that go on. There's a lot that goes into this. So I'm only going to touch on a couple of the wars. But there's some really long-term effects of the Protestant Reformation that you may not even think about. The Reformation strongly affected the development of the ideas of capitalism, democracy, and nationalism. This was because of the new ways in which the Bible was interpreted, the changing role of the church and society, and just the way people viewed Christianity in their everyday life. Uh, the Reformation is seen as a is a victory for political leaders in this power struggle between church and state that had been going on for centuries. The separation of church and state begins to accelerate after the Protestant Reformation. The idea of Calvinism. Uh, Calvinism develops and emphasizes the individual's role in salvation and the individual decision making of within the church. And this helps people gain some knowledge of democracy. This helps people gain some idea of personal determination. A big negative, the Protestant Reformation destroys the idea that the Catholic Church was all-powerful, led to the development of the stronger monarchs, and led to these wars of religion. Now the Reformation split Europe into two, maybe even three different camps. In one camp, you have Italy, Spain, France, Belgium, Ireland, Southern Germany, Austria, Poland, Hungary. Those countries remain primarily Catholic. The Netherlands, England, Scotland, Northern Germany, Switzerland, and the Scandinavian countries of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they become primarily Protestant. And England is a different type of Protestantism because it's very closely related to Catholicism. So you have these two or maybe three camps, depending on the way you look at it. Now you have the French Civil War, uh, 1572 to 1598. You have Catholics versus Huguenots. And a Huguenot, that's just a fancy way to say French Calvinist. Um, there's a big war. Henry III of Navarre, which was a part of France, marries Margaret of Valois, who was the, the sister of King Charles, who controlled most of France. They are Catholic, and because of this marriage, there is a mass assassination of French Calvinists during the, uh, the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day. 
This civil war does not end until 1598 when the Edict of Nantes is issued, which guaranteed at least temporarily freedom of religion within France. Closely related and happening at the same time is the Dutch War of Independence from 1565 to 1609. The, the Dutch War of Independence broke out in 1565 when King Philip II, who was a Habsburg, attempted to force Catholicism on the Protestant Dutch. Thousands of Dutch were killed, and because of the bloodshed that happens, multiple provinces decided to declare their independence from the Habsburg Empire, which at that point in time was controlled by the King of Spain. Fighting is going to continue off and on until 1648. Even the English Civil War can be traced back to the, Re the Reformation and can be considered a religious war. The English Civil War, it devolved from a dispute between the Anglican Church, which is also known as the Church of England or the Episcopal Church, and their Catholic monarchs who were the Stuart family. About a hundred years after the death of Henry VIII, who created the Church of England, the Stuart family are in charge of the country. They are Catholic. Most of the country by this time are Protestant. And things get so bad that Parliament is going to overthrow the Stuart monarchy. Now, in reality, this happens because the Stuarts try to reinstitute this idea of absolutism I'll talk about in a moment, but it can all be traced back to Protestantism versus Catholicism. Now, what happens in the English Civil War? Uh, King James I is defeated by a guy named Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell is going to become the de facto leader of England. Uh, he still has to work through Parliament technically, but he has control of Parliament. Eventually, Cromwell dissolves Parliament completely and runs England as a dictatorship for about 10 years. When Oliver Cromwell dies, instead of having his son become the next Lord Protector, Parliament says, we've had enough of this, and they go and find the son of King James and ask him to come back and become the king. So we end up with James II and the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. Of all of these religious wars, though, the Thirty Years' War is the absolute biggest. Uh, this is a, going to be a conflict between Protestants, led by Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden, and Austrian Catholics, who are part of the Habsburg Empire. Most of the fighting happens in the German kingdoms in the middle of Europe that were collectively known as the Holy Roman Empire. And by the time it's over, it turns into this political struggle for who will control Europe between France, Austria, Spain, and Sweden. Uh, the war starts in the year 1618 when four representatives of the Catholic Church go to Bohemia, which is modern-day Czech Republic. And they try and convince the people of Bohemia and the government of Bohemia to become Catholic again. And this whole situation came about because the Habsburg family, who are Catholic, had gained control of the throne of Bohemia. Now, at first, the Habsburgs were okay with the Bohemia being Protestant, but eventually they said, no, 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 you have to come back and be Catholic. So... On May 23rd of 1618, these four Catholic representatives asked the leader of Bohemia to disband the Protestant government. The Protestant government says no, but they do agree to allow Catholicism to return in a limited manner, as long as the Protestants aren't going to be messed with. Uh, the head Catholic representative tells the Protestants that he can't make that decision right away and tells the government he has to go back and talk to the Habsburg king. Uh, it's not good enough because these Protestant leaders want an immediate answer. 
Now, a letter supposedly is produced almost immediately that's from the emperor that says, no, 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 the Protestants have to go. That's the only thing that can happen. And two of the four Catholic representatives are thrown out a window. And this becomes known as the defenestration of Prague. That is a great word, by the way. Defenestrate means to throw somebody out a window. Now, this was a third story window. It was about 70 feet above the ground. Uh, but thankfully, nobody gets hurt because either purposely or on accident, nobody knows, there was a wagon with hay underneath the window. Now, the final straw of this is when the Habsburg Emperor dies and the people of Bohemia refuse to accept the new emperor of their own and instead choose a different person to be their king. So suddenly, Frederick V, who is the appointed king of Bohemia, and Ferdinand II, who is the emperor of the Habsburgs, fight. The fighting is going to go on until 1625. Ferdinand II wins. But the Bohemians aren't done yet. They look for outside help. They find that help in King Christian IV of Denmark. Um, more fighting happens. Everybody fights to a draw. And then at the last minute, in the last phase of this war, Catholic France enters the war on the side of the Protestants. This shocks everybody, but France looks at the, the layout of Europe and they realize Austria is our biggest rival. And if we side with their enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So France, even though they're Catholic, they enter the Thirty Years' War on the side of the Protestants because they see a political advantage as more than a religious advantage. In the end, the Peace of Westphalia is signed in 1648. All parties decide to negotiate an end to the war. Each individual kingdom and principality that made up the Holy Roman Emperor is given the right to make their own peace treaty. They're given the right to have their own diplomacy with other countries. And this splits up Germany even more than it already had been. And Germany does not become a unified country until 1873 because of the fallout from the Treaty of Westphalia and everything that's going on with these religious wars. Now, one last thing to talk about in this lecture is the idea of absolutism. The idea of absolutism is best seen in the idea of France, um, but it does exist in some other places. Absolutism is derived from the traditional assumption of power and the belief in the divine right of kings. And the reason it's most strongly associated with France is due to the visions of Joan of Arc during the Hundred Years' War and how Charles VII became King of France in the year 1429. There are some characteristics of European absolutism. Um, for example, there's one ruler who's associated with the country, and this is going to be a strong ruler that nobody questions. There are few or no national assemblies, so the ruler doesn't have to listen to anybody else. The ruler or the king has almost, if not complete, control of the nobility. And then there are these career officials that are appointed and answer only to the king or queen. They typically have long standing and professional armies that are expensive, and then they have secret police that spy on you and double check that you're not plotting against them. Now, King Louis the 14th, also known as the Sun King, he is the absolute best example of absolute monarchy, but it goes back even further than that. Uh, Charles VII, like I said, 1429, he is crowned king because Joan of Arc has a vision from the Christian God saying you need to have him appointed king, and if he's 
crowned, then France will win. So right off the bat, Charles says, I was appointed by God. God gave Joan of Arc the vision. Therefore, you can't question me because questioning me is the same as questioning God's choice. From there, it goes on to Henry of Navarre, who is known as Henry IV. Uh, he strengthens the monarchy. He issues the Edict of Nantes, the idea of religious toleration. Um, and he's assassinated in 1610 when Louis XIII takes over. And because he's just a kid when Louis XIII takes over, he has a regent or a helper really controlling things. This helper, by the way, was a Catholic named Cardinal Richelieu. And Cardinal Richelieu started to undo the Edict of Nantes and Carl, Cardinal Richelieu started to persecute and try to drive out all the Protestants. Louis XIII, he dies at the age of 41. His five-year-old son, Louis XIV, becomes the new monarch. And he grows up from a very, very young age, having everything done for him and having everybody listen to him. So he's going to be an absolute monarch because he controls everything and he thinks he runs everything and he's taught from a young age, from the age of five, that he is the end all and be all, the answer to everything. Louis XIV is in charge of making all of his decisions. Louis XIV, he decides what does and does not happen in France. Louis XIV decides who and does and does not get jobs. Louis XIV is even going to arrange a way to personally pay for the army of France. So therefore, the army of France only listens to him. There's a lot more I could go into with the idea of absolute monarchy, but I am very limited in my time. I wish I could go on more because this is an entire lecture that I, I think you would enjoy. Um, but it's not the only place that you see the idea of absolute monarchy. Uh, absolute monarchy is going to develop in Russia. Uh, Peter the Great is going to reorganize the military of Russia, put it directly underneath his control. And Peter the Great is going to reorganize the government completely and take control of everything. Prussia, which is part of modern day Germany, they also develop an absolute monarchy when the Hohenzollern family creates a centralized government, they take control of tax collecting, and they are suddenly unquestionable and everybody has to answer to the Hohenzollern family. So there are many places where this idea of absolute monarchy is going to grow. On the flip side is constitutional monarchy, and you're going to find this in England. The reason constitutional monarchy develops in England is a result of the English Civil War. In the English Civil War, as we talked about a minute ago, Oliver Cromwell fails, James II is put back on the throne. And at first, James II agrees to do what Parliament says. And James II says, I will be Protestant. But in reality, James II is going to convert to Catholicism and he's going to try and reinstitute the idea of absolute monarchy in England. Once Parliament figures out that's what's happening, Parliament forces James II out of the country and they invite William of Orange, who was the king of, of the Netherlands, to become the new English monarch. Now, the reason they, got, they chose William of Orange, he was married to Mary, who was one of James's kids. So it was seen as, quote, legit. One of the things that happens when William and Mary agree to become king and queen of England, they sign paperwork that gives away much of their power to Parliament, and they agree that Parliament can have the bulk of 
decision making. And a constitution of forms is agreed to. So the English Parliament is going to gain control of the economy. The English government is going to gain control of tax collection. So the English Parliament is going to be in control of spending. The English Parliament is going to guarantee civil rights and civil liberties, personal rights, personal liberties. And then the English monarchs are taken away the ability to appoint judges of their choice and government officials of their choice. This idea of constitutionalism and a constitutional monarchy is going to be the beginning of the English system we have today where Queen Elizabeth II is, for most purposes, a figurehead. Now, in reality, there are still rights, privileges, and powers that Elizabeth II has, but she chooses not to exercise them and voluntarily give some of those rights to Parliament. But the end result is, in a constitutional monarchy, we have shared power. It's not just one person with all the power. There's still a queen or a king, but the power is divvied up and the power is shared amongst others. Now for this week, if you haven't already seen it, there is one reading you have to do and that is the 95 Theses by Martin Luther. So this is that list of 95 things that Martin Luther came up with that he wanted to see the Catholic Church change. And as you read this, you might notice that he, he has a personal problem with the Pope. And I really want you to read this and kind of think about why that might be after listening to this lecture and reading your textbook some. Also this week, I'm on the course schedule, you'll see chapter 17 quiz. This is based off of reading the book and your first discussion. So if you look at this, at our lesson here, you'll see a discussion three tab and you'll see some students have already done it. and. Look here, it says, please answer the following question after reading this chapter of the textbook, as well as the primary source document for this week. Um, to fully answer these questions, you do have to have more than one sentence. There's no way you can answer these questions with just one simple sentence. So question number one, based on the 95 Theses reading, why? what do you feel Martin Luther was asking the church to change? So given what I said about the clerical um, ignorance and the immorality and all of that stuff, and then reading this list of grievances, tell me what you think. What was he trying to get changed and why? Do you think after reading this that Martin Luther was upset with the church in general, meaning Christianity, or was he upset with the way the Catholic church was running things? And what tells you that? And then last but not least, if you were a Christian in 1517, you would have been Catholic. And what do you think you would have thought or how would you have felt once you read the 95 Theses and you see somebody saying, hey, this is everything the church was doing wrong, fix it. Just curious what you have to think there and what you say. Well, I appreciate you watching this video. And uh, remember, um, Tuesday, as long as everything goes right at 2 p.m. I will record the next video lecture and that will be done in Blackboard Collaborate. So if you want to join me next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Um, I'll say hi to you and I'll give you a little bit of extra credit for doing so. Until next time, we will see you soon. Have a great week. Bye.